Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. After months of negotiations, could there be an agreement in principle on the president's ambitious spending proposals? Well, it depends on whom you ask. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says things are close. We've 90 percent of the bill agreed to and written. We just have some of the last uh, decisions to be made. Uh, it is less than we had uh, was projected to begin with, but it's still bigger than anything we have ever done in, the, in, in terms of addressing the needs of America's working families. But the remaining 10 percent remains a significant hurdle. And one of the big questions, how are Democrats going to pay for it all? West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, whose lack of approval so far has driven much of the negotiations, said Monday morning that he does see a framework deal for the president's economic agenda happening sometime this week. President Biden told reporters he agrees. How was your meeting with Senator Manchin yesterday? How did your meeting go, sir? It went well. A few more things to work out, but it went well. Do you think you'll have a plan before Wednesday? With the grace of God and the goodwill of neighbors. Do you want a plan, a deal by the time you leave for COP? Is yes. that something you've expressed to Democrats? That, that, that's, my, that's my hope. The president and first lady head to Europe on Thursday. California Congressman Ro Khanna, a leader of the House Democrats Progressive Caucus, had this to say. The president looked us in the eye and he said, I need this before I go represent the United States in Glasgow. American prestige is on the line. Many members understand that. We're working very hard to get a deal. Uh, I understand we're close and I'm confident we're going to get there. The price tag of the bill has gone from three and a half trillion dollars down to somewhere under two trillion. Approval ratings for the president illustrate an increasing challenge for the White House. A Gallup poll shows 42 percent for that approval rating for Joe Biden. That's a 14 percent dip since June. Joining me now are Nicole Killian, Meredith McGraw, and Eugene Scott. Nicole is a CBS News congressional correspondent. Meredith is a national political correspondent for Politico. And Eugene is a national political correspondent for The Washington Post. Welcome to you all. A lot to get through today. I feel like we always say this every Monday, but it seems as though we're a bit closer. Meredith, let me start with you. Separate from the president's social spending proposal, Politico has reporting on when a possible vote on the bipartisan an infrastructure bill might happen. What can you tell us? Well, of course, President Biden has expressed he wants to um, get this bill passed before he heads to Europe this week. And Pelosi has also said that she's hoping that they can wrap things up by the end of the week, particularly before Halloween, uh, when we're going to run out of uh, surface transportation spending. So there is a real urgency to get things done. And there is an optimism that we could have a vote on all of this by the end of the week. And of course, um, my colleagues at, at Playbook, I think, put things so perfectly for what is on the line for President Biden right now. Today, he was in New Jersey. He was trying to sell that Build Back Better plan to constituents there. Um, and then they're hoping to pass this bill this week. And then he takes off on Thursday to go to Europe. He's going to be going to Rome, to the Vatican, to be meeting with the Pope and also the G20 Leaders Summit. And then he's going to be heading off to Scotland, where he's going to be meeting with world leaders to talk about um, the very important issue for his administration, climate change. Um, and then hanging over all of this, too, is next week we have two very important gubernatorial races that are really going to set the tone for um, the midterm elections coming up and really be the first marker for how the, the Biden administration really is doing. And all eyes, a lot of national attention has been on the gubernatorial race in Virginia. That will really be a test of how things are going. So we're going to be seeing if this bill can be accomplished um, by the end of the week. And then we're also going to be seeing <laughs> next week um, how voters are really feeling about everything going on. I know so much to look forward to in like the next week, a uh, week and a half or so. So, Nicole, let me ask you about this. Senator Joe Manchin and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer met with President Biden over the weekend with the goal of reaching a deal on that reconciliation package. What are the sticking points? What do we know about those issues that they're still hung up on right now? Well, uh, you know, Leader Schumer said that they really just have to hammer out another 
three or four issues. Um, what we know uh, up until this point is that there have been some uh, sticking points, for instance, over some of the climate provisions since the uh, clean electricity uh, performance program that is pretty much out. That was something that, uh, you know, progressives were really pushing for. Uh, so now uh, there has been talk about possibly seeking some type of alternative. There's also some question about, you know, Medicare expansion. Uh, it had been the hope, again, of some progressives, namely Senator Sanders, to try to expand a dental and vision coverage uh, for seniors. But uh, that seems less likely. So that was another uh, hang up. And then, of course, there's the issue of pay fors. And as you know, Senator Cinema has expressed some concerns with uh, using corporate tax hikes as a mechanism to pay for this package, even if the price tag on it ultimately comes down. Um, but, you know, there has been talk of a potential wealth tax. Uh, but again, the details behind that uh, aren't as clear in terms of exactly how that would work and if it would be sufficient to cover uh, the price tag. So those are a couple of the hurdles that uh, have been lingering uh, over the past, you know, week plus. Well, Eugene, meantime, President Biden traveled to New Jersey today, where he was pitching the spending and infrastructure bills, also campaigning for uh, Governor Phil Murphy, who's up for um, re-election. But what was President Biden's message on, you know, the infrastructure and spending bills? Well, it's been what it has been since he first introduced uh, the bill in its original form. He was trying to make the case for so much of the programming that he believes uh, the bill needs to support to make America literally better, as his bill would say. Uh, his hope always is to speak to voters so that they can lead lawmakers into uh, supporting ideas that the constituents support. You know, Biden made it very clear very early on that one of his strategies would be not trying to persuade uh, maybe Republicans and even some Democrats, but uh, get the voters to make it very clear through polling and, and their outreach and even activist base uh, with the hope that that would uh, influence how those in Congress uh, responded to uh, Biden's agenda. You know, um, Nicole, a lot of what we heard, um, you know, months before was about how, from Democrats, was about uh, the wealthy paying their fair share. And Democrats now adjusted tax rates to accommodate Arizona Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema. So what does that um, new so-called wealth tax look like? Well, I think we're all waiting to find out. You know, there haven't been many details, uh, nor has there been, uh, you know, extensive legislation uh, on this where, you know, we, we know exactly how it will work. But uh, just to give you a sense, I mean, our understanding of it is that, you know, this would be some type of tax on those making in excess of a billion dollars a year. So we're really talking about a very small percentage of Americans here. Obviously, the president had favored a corporate tax. Uh, increases, uh, you know, as one mechanism to do that. But as you point out, that is something that Senator Sinema, at least for now, appears to be against. So, uh, you know, Senator Juan Wyden has been uh, one of the senators who's been key, you know, in terms of uh, working on this issue of a potential wealth tax. And, uh, you know, at this point, uh, that seems the direction that Democrats uh, are headed if they can make it work. So, Eugene, um, with President Biden heading to Europe later this week, given the fact that the spending plan is not a certainty, what is it that he's hoping to accomplish overseas? Well, as you know, we've had polling uh, repeatedly communicate towards the end of the Trump administration that uh, America's standing uh, globally had decreased. And so Biden has been very vocal in this first year about his desire to return uh, America to its previous prominence on the global stage. And part of that for him obviously involves uh, putting forward policies and ideas and financial support towards uh, climate issues. And he's expected to speak on those uh, and remind other uh, developed countries that America will be reliable when it comes to tackling so many of uh, the environmental issues that many world leaders believed uh, America stepped away from under uh, Trump's presidency. And so that is going to be one of uh, his main priorities uh, when he goes overseas this week. Well, Meredith, the Treasury Secretary confirmed that high inflation could stay that way well into next year. What are the potential political consequences of that when it comes to the midterms? Yeah, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that she expects 
inflation to linger into the second half of 2022, of course, a midterm year. And she also addressed concerns from former Treasury Secretary um, Larry Summers, who said that um, monetary policymakers have let things get out of control. And she said that while she disagreed with that, she said Americans really are facing a level of inflation that we haven't seen for a very long time. The Biden administration has said that so much of this is just a temporary problem. The economy is going through growing pains as we work towards ending the pandemic and inflation will come down as kinks in the supply chain are worked out. But there's a lot of finger pointing going on right now and debate about what's causing it. Uh, the New York Times reported that a regional Fed analysis found that Biden's 1.9 trillion COVID stimulus could be part of the problem. Uh, the supply chain issues have also been blamed. And there was also a CBS poll that said 60 percent of Americans don't think the Biden administration is doing enough when it comes to inflation. So uh, this is a real economic issue that voters are trying to face when they reach into their pocketbooks. And there's no doubt that this is going to continue to be a big political issue as we head into the midterm election year and really a, a tough issue for President Biden uh, to face as he tries to bring the economy back after this pandemic, but also tackle some really serious um, economic issues here. Right, because consumers and voters are reminded of this every time they go fill up the car at the gas station or they go buy groceries at the grocery store, and that bill is just a bit higher. Um, switching gears, Eugene, former President Trump has waded into some of the upcoming races before the midterms. Here's Missouri Republican Senator Roy Blunt on what he would like to see from the party standard bearer. I'm, I'm of the view that the best thing that the President Trump could do to help us win majorities in 2022 is talk about the future, and he can be an important part of that, this 22 effort. Uh, but I think better off to talk about the future than to focus on uh, the past in every election. All right, so we have not been hearing former President Trump focusing on the future. Um, if anything, we've heard him focus on what has happened in the past. But, Eugene, how does accepting or at least refusing to dispute former President Trump's um, baseless uh, claims of a, a widespread election fraud complicate things for Republicans? Well, it's a reminder to uh, many of the voters, including some Republicans, but mostly Democrats and independents, uh, that this is not a party that may be responding uh, to the January 6th attacks uh, in a way that most voters uh, believe it should be. There's real concern to see uh, what happened uh, that has not yet been made public. If there were lawmakers involved, what types of uh, communications and relationships uh, social media played uh, with organizers? And uh, these are questions that people really feel like they need answers to. And, and Republicans uh, not being willing to uh, support ongoing investigations or even being able to acknowledge that the election results were what they actually are is a reminder to the millions of voters who voted against the GOP uh, in 2020 that this is a party that perhaps is not taking the issues as seriously um, uh, as many of these voters would like them to, uh, even, you know, nearly a year after the election. Well, Meredith, you mentioned earlier in the segment that Virginia gubernatorial uh, contest. How is Glenn Youngkin, the Republican gubernatorial candidate in Virginia, um, essentially trying to strike that balance between sort of embracing the voters um, who support President Trump, former President Trump, while at the same time keeping his distance from the former president himself? Well, I think... Uh, balance is the key word that you mentioned there. Youngkin is really trying to do a very tricky political balancing act. He wants to be Trumpy enough that MAGA voters will still support him and embrace him, but he doesn't want to be so Trumpy that he scares away independent voters in Virginia that are going to be so critical in this really tight race. I do think it's notable that Donald Trump hasn't shown up here. Um, he did call into a rally to support, but he hasn't physically made an appearance, even though he's had rallies across the country um, since he did leave office. And, you know, Democrats would love to see this race be a referendum on Donald Trump, especially as Biden's approval ratings continue to um, dip lower and lower. But this race is really going to be a test for Democrats as to whether or not that uh, strategy can, can stand. And for Republicans, if Youngkin is able to squeak this out, it 
he really will be the template for how the GOP looks at the upcoming midterm elections. Donald Trump continues to be an important figure in the party. He continues to drive out enthusiasm from the base, and he continues to drive the conversation in a lot of ways for the Republican Party. Yet at the same time, he is also the party's biggest boogeyman. Uh, he has said some things, as you know, we talked about earlier, Senator Roy Blunt saying he wishes he would focus more on the future than the past. That continues to be an issue as he relitigates the 2020 election. So how uh, things turn out here in Virginia is yet to be seen. I know we will all be closely watching that race, uh, but especially uh, any political party, any politician that is trying to figure out how they're going to move forward with the 2022 midterms. It'll be fascinating to see what happens. Nicole, Meredith, and Eugene, thank you all very much. Really appreciate it.